When COVID hit, life changed for many. For my friend, he was devastated. He had to start working from home. You see, my friend was a social bee at work. He was the person always talking during the meetings, getting to know everybody, and going to people's desks to see how they're doing, and striking random conversations with you in the hallways. I never expected someone to be so unhappy working from home. As for myself, I've embraced this lifestyle, and working from home enabled me to do that more. I readily grew accustomed to it as it enabled me to do more of the things I enjoyed. In this video, I'm going to tell you the same tips that I told him to get him started on his journey to become a digital nomad. And here is our room, yeah, our makeshift room for the week. We work the evenings and we ski during the day. It works perfectly. First things first, you gotta have good internet if you plan to work as a digital nomad. When my wife and I first started off, we used to think in the US we're guaranteed good internet and we were unpleasantly surprised to find that you cannot really just rely, no matter where you are in the world, for a hotel, no matter how nice it might seem to have good internet. We've stayed at some nice resorts and some budget hotels, and I would say that they don't necessarily correlate to how good their IT people are at setting up their internet and making sure you're guaranteed in, in the room you're gonna be staying at that you're going to have good internet. We've seen all sorts of different things from you have to go to the lobby to get internet, a business room, you have to go to a local cafe nearby. There's all sorts of little tricks that hotels can get by with and you may find yourself without internet and it's going to be near impossible to go focus in a internet cafe that's going to be quite noisy sometimes and to each their own and so it's important to do a little bit of research and planning you have to make sure you're going to have good internet if you're going to do this well so you need to make sure your room is going to have good internet so ask the hotel when you get there that you're going to be working in your room and you need strong internet. So make sure you're very specific and clarify and that they can set you up with a room that's near a router. And some hotels, they have the router inside the room and so you don't have to worry about having good internet. But in some cases, you might only have it on certain floors, you might only have it on the first floor and there's all sorts of things. But if you indicate that you need internet and they can make sure that you have a room that's gonna be near their internet or at least where they know it's gonna be strongest. When doing your travel planning, search beforehand that the hotel has good and i've seen a growing trend on the internet because the age of the digital nomads is here that they're advertising their internet speeds more often but even despite that find that they offer internet hopefully one that offers good speed read the reviews usually people who stayed there will mention how good their internet is at least to their experience and in worst case comes worse you can call them or email them and ask them how good their internet is you tell them you need you're going to be working there you need at least three millibytes per second ideally five or more if you're going to be doing a bunch of remote communication or anything intensive on the internet and if you're going to be having more than one person working on the internet at the same time i recommend five to eight and anything over 10 is excellent work stress can get to you especially if you're working a lot of hours and what's the point of being a digital nomad if you're always working and so having that Balance between work and life is super critical and important. I'm a very dedicated person when it comes to my work and I'm very passionate about the work I provide. Being I want my employer and the people I work with to see my work as high quality work. And so I have very high temptation to always work more and work after hours and be able to produce more. However, as I've grown as an engineer and also a person who really wants to do a lot of my personal life as well, while still wanting to provide value as an employee as well, that there is a balance. Yet, I've worked for employers that did not respect my time. And you will come into a case where I'm sure you will be in a similar situation where in my off hours, I was being called, I was being texted, I 
went on a hike on a weekend and I was called to immediately start providing work or asking questions because I wasn't responding to instant messages while I was hiking. And so this was getting ridiculous. And I even once I was burning out at this point, I decided I needed a sick day just to take some time off and recuperate from my own burnout. And I was called on my day on that day I was sick. And so at this point, this this is a clear violation of my own boundaries. And so I needed to make that judgment call that this wasn't going to work. This is not an employer I can be working with for the long term. And I decided to leave that employer and find new work elsewhere. And this was such a fantastic decision for me, even though it was a good job by all respects and it was well paying. I needed to find that balance where I could have my personal balance and free time and still be able to find that job satisfaction I needed. And so a clear and decisive cut when I could be working and when I could be doing things on my own personal time. And so with that said, it's very important to be able to have that clear and defined boundary in your life of when you'll be working and when you'll not be working. Those scheduled boundaries. And so you should try and encourage those with your coworkers, with yourself, and have those boundaries. And with that said, it's also worth noting when you're working, it's always ideal to also work at the same time your coworkers are so you don't violate their boundaries in their off hours as well. If there are circumstances where you are shifting your time schedules, let everyone know, communicate it. As long as people are expecting it, they won't feel you're violating their boundaries. With that said, I would never advise that you shortchange your employer by working less hours than what they're expecting you to work. If anything, you want to provide that expectation of what your employer is asking you to work and even achieve as much as you can with those hours as possible. You want to be a reliable individual that everyone can expect can always achieve more than what is expected without going into your own personal time. So this is going to require a lot of skill building in your own personal journey. For example, if you're trying to be a person who can double their productivity, you can either put your time into improving the skills to double the productivity in the same amount of time. Let's say I'm working 40 hours a week. I can double the amount that I can get done in that 40 hour a week without doubling my hours. The alternative is I could double the hours, but then I'm sacrificing my own personal time, my own personal journey where I could be learning, experiencing things, enjoying my time, and more importantly, taking my mind off of work because Let's face it, burnout is real. I will say working remotely when you don't have as much social connection, the feeling of burnout can affect you even more. And that's why it's also important to make sure you have a cap on the amount of hours you're working because working more than that will also burn you out even faster. And what good is a job if you're hating it? Burnout will make you hate your job, will make you hate your coworkers, will make you hate your life. And so burnout is a real thing. And trying to put those systems in place to make sure you don't burn out is important. Ah, and I apologize in the second shot. I realized my lighting wasn't super good. So one side will be a little darker. I fixed it on this one. So moving forward, I've met many people who choose to work in the office over remotely. This is because there can be a lot of distractions in your life when you're working at home, being too much phone time. Maybe your parents or your family are getting on your nerves or just a lot of things at home are distracting. If you are one of these people, how are you going to make this digital nomad life work? As I progress with my career, one thing I came to understand more and more is your time is valuable. And ultimately, your employer is hiring you to give a specific value to them that is going to help drive the business. The more and more capable you become, the more valuable you are, eventually be overwhelmed with information that is going to slow you down and make it hard to provide the value you used to. So you need to grow 
specific skills that will help you scale better. And I quickly learned this as sometimes I would get hundreds of emails and eventually thousands of messages and it would just be overwhelming to read them all. They would all come in throughout the day and if I were sitting there just waiting for messages or reading those messages at different intervals, I would have no time to focus and get nothing done. This it is impossible to do my job well and it's impossible to provide that value I need to provide to my employer. So ultimately, you have to think of what really matters and balance that communication style that remote work or even in-office work requires. So here's my suggestion. You should have a plan for your day, being that when you start your day, think of all the things you need to accomplish in that day and make sure that you have enough time to do that. You should also balance the meetings you have in that day with your goals. So if you have five hours of meetings, it's gonna be hard to do five hours of work unless you're gonna be working overtime, which I don't really advise. So it would be better to see about trying to limit the amount of work you can provide and communicate to the people depending on the value that you have this three hours. And maybe you could even suggest, hey, I would like to get five hours of work done. I'm gonna skip two of these meetings that I feel like I don't need to provide a lot of value on. So I'm just gonna go ahead and skip them. And so I have that focus time. And once you have a good split of your day and you understand how much time you have outside of those meetings, then you can better hold yourself to a bar of how well you're estimating your time. So if I'm estimating I have five hours of work that I want to do, how close am I getting to the work that I wanted to accomplish in that day? And I need to remove distractions, place the phone away, stop responding to messages while I'm focusing and try to get that work done as as efficiently as I can and and train that skill of hard focus and trying to get as much work as you want done in the time frame that you've been given yourself. So if I focus for five hours and I wanted to achieve this, did I meet my goal? If not, what can I do better next time? And what did I struggle with to get that five hours of work that I thought done? Maybe I just underestimated how long something would be and that's a takeaway and I can make sure I get better estimates next time. So the important thing is this is a skill of estimating your work and understanding how much work there is when you commit to something. And if you never really practice trying to become good at the skill of estimating your time and evaluating what went well and what didn't go well, it's really hard, if not impossible, to get strong at this skill. And the more you practice, the better you will get over time. When you never meet your coworkers and work with them face to face, it can feel disassociative and even disconnected. And this is a common feeling in all of us because people are used to seeing other people. And this can definitely be the case when in environments where you don't talk to people face to face, even in video conversations like we are now. It's important to have that face to face interaction, even remote. And so if you're a person that never turns on their camera or never shows who is on the other side of your profile picture, people start disassociating themselves from who you are and think of you, even though not consciously, subconsciously thinking of you as just something or a little, it's a robot because they don't see you as a person. And so effective communication and getting to know to your coworkers is super important so that you can become more than a robot, a real person to them. So getting to know your coworkers is important and making real and meaningful connections. And through my entire career, let me tell you that it's not the projects that I've done the most on or I've been most proud of working on that I remember to this day. It's the people that I've struggled with, I've enjoyed working with, and I made meaningful connections with that I remember most. Being managers, teammates, or people I worked heavily with made a difference. And when I think about all of my past working experience, things that I admire most. So you're robbing yourself of that, those real human connections if you never tried to build them. So the important thing is understand that working remote is easier to be disassociative. In fact, you'll have to work harder to get to know someone because 
you don't see them regularly in the office and have the natural ability to just kind of have these casual conversations. You're going to have to take time out of your work schedule to send someone a message and ask, hey, how are you doing today? I hope your day is good and I hope you're feeling better than you were last week over the hardships they were having. Just taking notes of what is happening in their daily lives, their personal lives, getting to know their personal lives to some degree. Do they have family? Do they have, what are their hobbies? And asking them, how's that going? You told me you're into running. How is that going? Are you improving? Is there something I'm getting into running myself? I'm interested in that. Can you share some of the tips that you have? And just having that fair exchange, because if you only talk about work, work meetings, work projects, or anything associated with work, you will never ever be seen as a person, as other person, because you're not really making real human connections. You're only a robot working with another robot trying to achieve something for a bigger corporation. But we're all humans and making those human connections and trying to go out of your way to make those human connections will make the difference. And like I said, it is harder remotely, but it's not impossible. People want those connections. So if you make yourself a person who goes out of their way to make those connections, you will find those meaningful connections out there. You can start with just identifying your top stakeholders, being maybe your manager, your teammates that you have to work with most, maybe people you find that you can have mentorship relationships with, people that you respect, people that you work with often. These are all just a handful of stakeholders you might identify that, hey, if I had a better connection with those people, that maybe my life will be a little bit easier. Because as you develop these connections, you'll start feeling that they trust you more, they, you trust them, and work becomes easier. And when you're having hardships, you share those hardships together instead of as an individual. And you start seeing that this is a real team and you're building those connections, those genuine human connections. Further, make sure you're turning on your camera. I don't always personally turn on my cameras in group meetings because honestly, group meetings aren't as good for building human connections as individual meetings or small meetings with like two or three people. Small meetings where you are bouncing ideas around and talking more freely and casually without wasting a big group of people's time. Those are the time that it's good to turn on your camera and get to know your peers and have those micro reactions and discussions that pop up out of nowhere and have fun with it and get to know your coworkers a little bit more. And you can't do that if people don't see you're not a robot. So turn on that camera, show them you're not a robot, you're a real human being and have some emotions. And humans, just as we're doing right now, you can see my facial reactions and my emotions. There's a lot of things you can read from someone's face that maybe you don't even think about. Subconsciously, it's processing at all times. And so when you don't see that, you just identify not a human, just a voice, and you disconnect from it. The hardest part you have to nail working as a digital nomad is how to communicate efficiently. From personal experience, from working in the office, to going remote. I have noticed that it is harder to get to know someone and to build trust with others. And this affects the communication that happens between them. When you're in the office, it's easy to just kind of look over and see someone's working on something and start asking on what that is and build some level of trust and communication there. Or maybe I, I have an immediate need, I can go just tap someone on the shoulder and get the information from them. It's a lot harder to do that remotely. And sometimes it will feel like a hurdle you have to jump just to send a question to someone. Because take it from personal experience, asking questions to people remotely feels a lot harder than asking them face to face. I don't know what it is, but I know it's a mental hurdle because you're not seeing, speaking to them face to face and you don't know how they're going to respond to this question. But it is a hurdle that you can jump over with enough practice. Further, it can be hard to identify the key stakeholders that you need to be communicating with across different projects. So here are my takeaways and what I've learned over the years. Always treat email as something that is not super important that you read. And so usually when someone's communicating by email, it's lower priority and treat it as non-urgent. 
when I'm coming back from focusing on something and I'll just quickly check my email, see if there's anything super important. This day and age, I feel email is being used a lot less and less over time. But most importantly, sometimes you get some information from those emails and so I usually sort them out to specific folders based on the sender and information in the title so I can intelligently group them and understand their value to me and certain projects that I'm working on. More importantly is real-time communications becoming more and more of a mainstream thing. And so this is something you want to check more frequently. And in fact, I try not to let someone who's messaged me be on hold for longer than four to eight hours at most and this is kind of on the upper end when I have a big queue of people I have to respond to but most importantly I do periodically check my messages so one big distraction a lot of people get themselves into is they need to respond to instant messaging quick and as they're coming in in real time this is a bad habit so it's gonna destroy your productivity and make you lose focus so I usually turn off notifications on all my instant messaging so that I only see that I um, have a message when I check for it. This is super important on Mac or Windows. Just turn off the notification. It's gonna ruin your focus a lot less. And so you focus on something for X amount of time and then come check your messages. But you'll want to check those frequently, like every half hour, an hour, and try to get through them based on some kind of personal prioritization, being you know your team, your manager inquiries first, things that seem critical, and then you will have other asks that come in and try and prioritize those as well. And so try and get to them all, but if you have to, use that prioritization to get through as many as you can and cap how long you're spending on messaging, being I'm only gonna spend 20 minutes replying to people and then I'm gonna go back to focus on the thing I should be doing and that's good enough. And one thing to note is off hour communication. If I need to send something off hours, I'll generally send an email because I feel it does mean and it communicates, hey, it's not very urgent. Sometimes there's still a prevalence that some people will get disturbed and have to respond in off hours. So I tried not to use like real time instant communication like through Microsoft Teams or Slack during someone's off hours and I try to avoid it altogether because it does stress people out. It, it snaps them out of the time that they should be having off of work and it doesn't allow them to turn off work, which leads to maybe a coworker burnout and you applying pressure and you don't want to be the person applying pressure to other people. There's enough people out there that'll be applying pretty, plenty of pressure to everybody. So don't be one of those people. Lastly, there are certain things that Slack and Microsoft Teams allow you to do and that's make posts in highly visible area and posts is something I would define as a very a rich and detailed information post in a specific space for high visibility and these are replacing what emails used to be used for whatever culture that your work uses either email or posts the important thing is that you have the right stakeholders that will see them and people can respond in line. And so these are just great areas to send information to lots of people, get visibility on it and maximize your communication. But it's important to note that try not to ever post in such a way that you're doing something controversial or having a big debate on it in a post. These things are more for getting information out to as many people as possible and not for trying to debate something. And those should happen in smaller groups with focused amount of stakeholders where it can be more productive. Death by meetings is a real thing and it's a slippery slope. So how do you avoid getting overwhelmed with meetings. From my own personal experience, as someone who's always strived to be a high value person, you'll eventually get to the point where everyone wants your opinion. They want you in all meetings and sometimes not attending a meeting could offend someone. And so you just start getting invited to all these meetings. However, you have to kind of decide what kind of work you're trying to provide. Because if you are providing work where you need focus time and individual contributions that need to drive things forward, then I would say you need at least five hours of focus time to make progress on those things. So trying to cap how much time you're spending in a meeting to 
two to three hours is a great idea. If you are an individual like a manager or in sales or marketing, where some of your primary contributions will be more of communication, then you might try to cap it at five to six hours of meetings and have one to two hours of individual contribution time where you can focus and move things forward for what you're trying to achieve. But you need to be the judge of that. I've been in situations where people aren't going to just automatically know what your time and schedule is. You're going to see a free slot and it's just going to be consumed. And so with that said, I need to defend my own schedule. Otherwise, if there is a free slot, someone's going to take it and I'm not going to have any time left to myself. And I've been buried underneath meetings to the point where it was even going over the eight hour limit that I tried to limit myself for for work. And with that said, in those meetings, there's a bunch of asks for me to do. And if I'm gonna have any time to do in those asks, I have to do them after work. And now it just slowly gets to the point where, yes, you're gonna hate those meetings and you're gonna be buried alive with asks and work that you're not gonna have time to do and just pass it forward. And then tomorrow it's gonna be the same thing again. And this burns me out, especially. I've really experienced a real feeling of death by meeting in some prior jobs where I needed to start setting more boundaries. But no one's gonna do that for you. You have to figure out how to do that for yourself. And here's how to do it. For one, as I mentioned, if people see a free slot on your calendar, they're gonna slap a calendar meeting on that slot. If you're an individual like this, the only way is to make sure you secure focus time as a meeting with yourself. And that is your dedicated time to get stuff done. And if you have to try and schedule the amount of time back earlier, I said five hours for someone who's trying to get individual contributions done and maybe one to two hours for someone whose primary goal is communication, but everyone needs focus time and slap those time slots on your calendar where you're going to be able to catch up with the work and whatever is expected of you through the day. And those are just going to be meetings with yourself. And you'll find sometimes, especially if you're a very valued person, people are going to ignore those and slap meetings over and expect you to attend. That doesn't work. This is when you need to stand up for your time and say, hey, I already have a meeting at the slot. This time doesn't work for me. Can we reschedule later in the week? If you, if it's just that you don't have a lot of slots free, then that's fine. They just need to schedule out. Some people don't like planning around busy people's schedule and they think that they can shortcut it, but you need to really be stern and just say, you know, I have I have a spot open two days from now. Let's just do it then. Or, you know, please find another slot. This doesn't work for me. You just have to really communicate and defend what your calendar gives. With that said, some people get a little carried away and go overboard with avoiding meetings. There are some meetings that are super important to you be to be able to function as a part of a team. And those are your direct team meetings one-on-ones with your team and your manager, meetings with your team that go into the daily stand up and happenings with your team and information that's pertinent to the daily beat and operations of your team. Retrospectives for your team to help grow and contribute to the success of the team. And there are many more. The team culture that your team decides on, you should feel free to contribute and make sure you have the right amount of meetings being not too much and not too little. And you will know. And when you're a part of a team, help contribute to those ideas and make sure you have the right balance of team meetings. But trying to find that balance of too many and too little is important for your team. Meetings that tend to be more useless are multiple standard. Being your direct team is doing something and then you might have multiple other teams or different places where you have to go and give information about how you're doing. Well, there are so many better ways to communicate team progress or project progress than many different standups. And not everyone needs to know what your status update is on a daily basis. I do think that your team needs to know because those are the people that are gonna be helping and balancing information across the team and trying to help those projects get done. But beyond that, 
it becomes really hard pressed to say that you should be going to multiple. So you have to be the judge of, of these yourself because there might be circumstances where they are helpful. But generally, I call these ritualistic meetings. Ritualistic meaning that they're on some cadence and give the information status that you're that you're working on to m multiple spheres. Your direct team is very important, but beyond that, be hesitant to accept those because ritualistic meetings will bury you alive <laughs> faster than anything else. One-off meetings tend to be a little bit more okay. Let's get together, share some information to achieve a specific purpose of this meeting. Let's get to a base understanding, or maybe I'm going to give you some information because you're ramping up on this area. Those things are great, and they are very excellent for moving things forward. And they are one-off, meaning we're gonna do this one time and then that's it. Those are okay, those are better than ritualistic meetings. So be hesitant to accept ritualistic meetings because they're hard to get out. It, the ones that are more useful are one-on-ones when you find that those relationships with those individuals that you're doing a one-on-one -on with are worth building. Further, a lot of meetings, especially ritualistic ones, can just be done what I call asynchronously or just communicating without a meeting, basically through a channel post, an email, maybe a group message. You just have to give a quick status update copy and paste it around, that's so much easier than having a block of time set aside to give a status update and to ruin your focus. And it's going to save you a lot more time than having to attend a specific meeting that is going to disrupt your current existing meeting schedule or your focus schedule. The way to ensure that you can work as a digital nomad is to be a highly respected and well-valued employee first, a person of high and immediate value to your employer. When you achieve these things, your employer will be more willing to allow you to have more grace than you would as, let's say, another average employee or a new employee. I once met this fellow who joined my company and immediately planned on the first opening week a trip to Europe and they'd be working in a different time zone and also learning from their team members on a fairly complex and high learning curve area. It just so happens our company failed to ship the needed equipment that the person needed in time for their trip. And so we had to go through all this hoopla to make sure we can get it to Europe. And it just ended up being weeks until this person can get caught up. And then when they were in this other country trying to communicate with us in a different time zone, they were working in the time zone of that other country in the daytime. And obviously this was not our daytime. And so we had almost like zero overlap in being able to help this person. Needless to say, things did not go well for this person. They were not employed for very long and it could have turned out so much better. So instead of being like this person, I suggest you listen to me and how I have worked for almost every employer and I've usually been fairly capable of talking them into being more flexible with my lifestyle. First of all, I would never start a job and immediately go and take a vacation. When you're trying to learn and you're starting a job, you want to impress people. And it's hard to impress people when you start off on the wrong foot. And so generally, if you're gonna be starting a new job, try not to plan a vacation or trying to do any digital nomading. If you're not super accustomed to it, don't be planning that within the first three to six months of time you start on that new job because you want to get ramped up and fully productive and you want your peers to respect you first and understand what you can do because you don't want to set the wrong precedence because if you do set the wrong precedence it's hard to undo that it takes it's almost like double or triple the difficulty to get out of that hole you've dug yourself further you want to understand what your direct stakeholders are being the person that you're going to be working with maybe your manager the people who care about your work most those are your stakeholders and get to know them and the value they expect of you and try to do really good at that value because those people are going to care about what you are doing most and you want them to to show them that hey i can give 110 percent of what you're expecting at all times and then when you're traveling, you want to work into that in a way that 
you're still delivering 110%. If you're always delivering more than what they want, and you're always doing this even while traveling, no one's gonna care that you're traveling. Honestly, your employer just wants you to do your job well, and they're maybe cautious of you traveling or not being in the office because they're uncertain, that people just don't work well remote. And your goal is to undermine that and show, hey, I can work anywhere, I can do anything, and I can still exceed your expectations. So that's number one. Number two, when you're learning something, you might have to put in some extra hours. I don't want you burning out on this thing, but by working extra hours, I mean that you're working extra hours on yourself. Being, I'm new to this job and I may have some of the skills needed to do it well off the bat. Maybe I'm really good at working at certain programming languages, but I'm new to these tools or I'm new to this architecture type. So I need to cover a little bit of ground here, but I'm not doing this for my employer because I feel some of these skills I can take with me to other employers and just be a better software engineer myself. So I'm going to take online courses. I'm going to read some books. I'm going to practice in my free time to get better at these things, not necessarily for my employer, but because I want to be a great software engineer. I want to be a good engineer. And I'm going to put that time into myself because that's only going to make me a better and more valuable person. And so, yes, I am working extra time, but I'm doing that because I'm going to get that back tenfold into myself and I can take that with me to any other employer. So with that said, invest into yourself and don't treat that as billable hours to your employer. Treat those as things that you need to pay up front to get good and impress your employer. So ultimately, don't be a person who only does just what they're asked. Be that high value person who goes above and beyond to impress. Be a person who helps their teammates. When you hear a teammate struggling with something, offer help. Ultimately, the more you are recognized as that person who does go above and beyond, you will become an anchor of your team. Recognized as a senior person of that team, it provides a lot of value and the team can't live without you. You become a high valued person. You can do this on any team you go to. And because you are such a high value person, it's harder to replace you. Everyone's replaceable, yes, but you're harder to replace being that now you're in a position where if you want something like being able to have that flexible time schedule, being able to work remotely and be that digital nomad, if you can show that you can be a digital nomad and be a high value person, no one's going to blink an eye. They don't want to lose you. They want to keep you happy. Your employer sees how much value you provide and want you to continue to provide that. Especially if they think that you're such a valuable person, another employer is going to snap you up as soon as you hit the market. They want to keep you happy and they want you to stay there. You want to be a person who your team and manager can confide in for the hardest and most difficult tasks they have to face. Along with efficient communication comes being able to project when you're going to get your work done by. And this is hard for a lot of people, especially engineers to give estimates of how long your work is going to take. And it takes a long time to build that muscle of being accurate. But the only way to get there is through practice and holding yourself accountable and learning along the way. But you will find when you become good at it, you will be a much more valuable person and people will trust you a lot more with when you say you're gonna get something done and you get it done and people will love working with you. So imagine this, you're in a situation where you're working with someone and you haven't worked with them well enough for a period of time. They say they're gonna get something done, but they don't tell you when. And a few days pass and you're wondering where it is. So you have to ask them, and maybe they take a while to get back to you. You start wondering to yourself, can I trust this person to get it done? Because maybe my project's gonna get blocked 
if they don't get it done. And maybe it takes them a few days and they get back to you and say they're not done with it yet. Maybe not really very clear and not really decisive on when it's going to get done. How's that gonna make you feel? Just put yourself in that situation right now. You're probably not gonna be really happy with the answer and you're questioning the value of this person to you and if you're gonna want to work with this person again. Imagine now, in a situation where this person say, give me five days, and they give you an estimate, five days, and then you probably don't even need to ask anymore. You're just going to wait five days and see where it is. Maybe they're already done with it, which is even great. That's If they're done with it in five days, imagine how you're gonna feel versus what you just felt in that other scenario. You're gonna feel great, like this person's super reliable. They're very trustworthy, but maybe they need more time. They and on the fifth day, they come to you and say, hey, it took me a little bit longer. I hit some complexities and I didn't expect them. I am learning still, you know, that's that's on me. But I am gonna do better and I think it's gonna take me two extra days. That is also gonna make you feel okay. It's like, all right, you know, five days, two more days, that's not that bad, they're getting closer and we're all learning together. This is also going to make you feel confident in this individual. So what I'm communicating here is communicating your timelines and deadlines and being very transparent with where you're at, especially in a remote situation, is going to build a lot more trust and make you appear as a more trustworthy person. So effectively, when you start a project, you should try and visualize what it's going to take for you to get that project done. Being all the small building blocks it's going to take along the way, the dependencies on other teams, the complexities that are involved, maybe you have to learn something for this to be achieved. And with all those factors, you can now start giving an estimate of how long it's going to be. I'm not really sure about this thing. I never worked with it before, so I'm gonna have to learn a little bit. Maybe ask some of my coworkers for some help. And so I'm gonna double the amount of time for that piece. And then the rest is fairly straightforward. So that's gonna roughly take five days or two weeks, however long it is. It's your promise to them that it's your estimate. And so with that said, your promise should try and buffer in some extra padding because as a rule of thumb, give a time that I can meet or beat, but never exceed. When you exceed, that is a problem that you should identify and just ask yourself, how can I do better next time? Provide better estimates. So always buffer in more. My rule of thumb is usually if I'm fairly knowledgeable and comfortable with the task, take whatever's in my mind like that first number that comes to my mind times it by 1.5. And if I know there are some difficulties with it, but I'm not entirely sure how to, how to tackle those difficulties, I times it by two. If there are things I need to learn a part of the process of getting it done, or I know there's some complexities that are gonna be really difficult to overcome, times it by three. And so these are just buffer estimates that I use as a golden rule to help me provide good estimates to someone else. Because again, it's better to meet or beat whatever time frame that you give someone, but try never to exceed. And when you do exceed those limits, it's okay to be transparent and say, my bad, you're learning, everyone's learning, and, and you gotta make mistakes. Even when you're an expert, you're going to make mistakes. But with that said, you have to own it. You have to be transparent. And so that iterative development of yourself and improving yourself will be super important. Being able to visualize the project as a whole and being able to help communicate and others visualize those complexities will help get other people to buy in to your, your estimate. And instead of just pulling out a number out of a hat, you know, if you can tell people the complexities of your project and all the things you have to work on, this helps them understand and buy into your estimate. If you feel it's a little bit high, then sometimes you have to justify that to others when they question, why is it? And as long as they can reason with your thinking, they will trust you and they will let you go forward and make that happen. And again, if you're wrong, own it, let them know, communicate when the next estimate's gonna be using that buffer to make sure you meet or beat, but try not to exceed, especially in the second time. 
and always be learning. When you do exceed or you don't meet the internal time that you expected of yourself, what can you learn and take away and improve your own processes? What kind of skills could you learn and improve on to get a little bit faster and make your development a little bit better? If you're always seeing how long things take and holding yourself to a high bar and trying to improve it, you will become a more valued person because you're gonna get faster at this stuff because you're always trying to push your own limits and you're always using data in your own input cycle of how long things are taking, you're gonna start getting a lot of skills and improving and soon enough, those things that used to be challenging to you maybe a year ago are no longer gonna be challenging. So you're now pushing even more and those things that you spend maybe five days on a year ago, now it can take two days or maybe one day. You know, you're really getting much faster and much more skillful because of all the skills and improvements you made. And now you actually need harder tasks to actually be challenged. Do you struggle with focus? Because remote work and being a digital nomad will strain that even further. Many people struggle with focus. Whether you're in the office or working remotely, you will find that focus is one of those things that limits your ability to be productive. And so I had this struggle myself starting off and as you're learning a job and growing into that and eventually becoming someone who people want more and more from, you will struggle with that focus. Everyone's gonna be asking you questions on areas you're knowledgeable about, asking for help, or wanting your input in meetings. And so with that, how do you still remain productive and being that high value individual? So one of the things that I explored and has been very successful with helping me as a practice tool to achieving those uh, the capability of, of getting up to high focus is the Pomodoro technique. And this is where you can spend, I think the official time is 25 minutes of focus and then five minutes of rest. What they call Pomodoro, which is a time period of intense hyper-focus and you focus on this one thing and remove all distractions during that time and you try to see how close you can get to accomplishing that one thing. So it, it might be writing an important document for your work and I'm going to give myself 25 minutes to write two sections of it and see how close I get. I'm gonna give myself 25 minutes and then after that five minutes rest, which might be taking my phone, checking my instant messages, checking my emails. You know, this is just de defocusing and then I'm gonna go into another Pomodoro session. You can see these intense focus sessions as a tool to see how much focus you can achieve and how well, you can achieve what you can when you remove all distractions for a specific amount of time. And anyone can do a focus session for at least a half hour. The better you can snap into focus, eventually you'll find you can do longer Pomodoros. You can even start considering Pomodoros as just a training tool to help you focus and you'll start being able to focus more and focus in different ways in different periods of time. It doesn't always have to be 25 minutes. You can find a system that works for you, but the important takeaway is finding a system that allows you to achieve high focus for a set amount of time that you can achieve a goal and see how close to hitting that goal you actually were able to achieve. So with that said, the important takeaway is that you should plan the important things that you need to achieve. So going back to what I said earlier, you got to have some kind of schedule, know what you want to achieve in that day. And you can break it into small iteratable chunks. If you're doing Pomodoros, that would be 30 minute chunks of work where if I have three hours free from meetings today, I'm going to be able to do six Pomodoros. And I'm going to break up that work so that I can put a reasonable and achievable amount of work into one of those 25 minute slots and I can realistically get it done and remove all distractions. That also means I'm not checking my email, I'm not checking my instant messages, I'm not checking my phone, I'm not browsing the internet. You are going to focus. And what's great about this tool is when you get really good at being able to focus, you'll be able to go into coffee shops, you'll be able to focus on a plane, you'll be able to focus on a bus. You'll be able, as your focus increases, you'll be able to find that it's more resilient to distractions because this is the one thing you're focusing on and you can zone everything else out. And the important thing at the end of it is evaluating 
what went well, what didn't go well, and what can I improve on? And so at the end of a Pomodoro, did I successfully hit what I wanted to achieve? If so, great, you're doing, you're, you're fantastic. Maybe you try to up it an increased challenge for your next Pomodoro because we're always trying to improve and if you're not challenging yourself, you're not improving. Or if you didn't hit it, what did you do wrong? Did you underestimate the ability for you to get this done in 25 minutes? If so, what kind of skills would actually help you get it done in the future? What kind of things could you practice more to get better at it? Did you just over assess how much you could do in this 25 minutes? Or maybe there was a thing that you discovered while doing this 25 minute task that actually increased the time. And these are all things that when you start making note of and learning from your accuracy and predicting and understanding how much things cost of your time will improve and you'll get better at assessing and estimating what you can actually achieve and even better what you can't achieve you'll find there's gaps in your skills and you'll actively be exploring how to improve those skills so that you can fit more into that 25 minute period and being able to do more with the time that you spend. And once you're done with your 30 minute block, then go ahead and check those emails. Maybe you give yourself 20 minutes or 30 minutes to get caught up on emails, get caught up on your instant messages. Maybe you have a meeting to attend, but this is where you spend your time getting caught up with other things. And then when you're caught up with those things, you'll have another focus session, another Pomodoro that you're gonna get back to work and continue the cycle over and over again. Now, with all that said, my friend, has happily embraced a digital nomad life as I have and is living a much more fulfilled life where work and life can meet together and provide that balance. And he is traveling across the world and doing something similar to me. And now that he's traveling, he has found the tips in this next video to be super enlightening and enabling him to travel more. Check it out.